Welcome to the USIA podcast, I'm Ian Bott. Maria Ho is a professional poker player as well as a television host and commentator. She is one of the top ranked female poker players in the world, a woman in poker hall of fame inductee and has over $4 million in live tournament winnings. She was born in Taiwan before moving to the United States and graduated from UC San Diego. Her live poker tournament record includes 63 World Series of Poker caches, five World Series of Poker final tables, one po World Poker Tour title, and numerous additional final tables on the professional poker circuit. She is one of the game's strongest ambassadors and is also featured as a contestant on The Amazing Race and American Idol. Maria Ho, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Many people would view poker as something of an unconventional career path. Uh, how did you get started playing poker and, and what did your path towards becoming a professional look like? I was always interested, even as a child, in strategy games, and I was taught bridge by my grandfather at a very young age. And it wasn't until I was in college when I discovered poker for the first time, but I immediately fell in love with it just because I'm a highly competitive person and it really fell in line with all of the other things that I was interested in as a kid. And so in terms of just moving from it being a hobby and something that I was doing recreationally to something that I decided to take on professionally and more seriously. It was really just the sense of, you know, throughout college wanting to do something uh, fun and something that wasn't really as structured as my entire life had been up until that point. You know, poker offered this opportunity to travel the world, um, to play a game that I loved competitively but I always had the sense that I would go back and get my master's in business administration actually, but that this would just be a year that I would take off between my undergrad and graduate studies. Um, but of course, you know, now 15 years later, I'm still playing poker professionally. And so it's just something that I think organically um, turned into more than what I originally anticipated it would be. Right. And, and clearly you've had a lot of success in the game, but when you're starting out, poker is a game with a lot of uncertainty, right? Um, how, what was your family's initial reaction when, when you decided to pursue poker? Yeah, well, you mentioned obviously that it is a bit of an unconventional path, especially I think for a woman and a woman that comes from a very strict Chinese background. I think culturally my parents could have never envisioned that this would be something that I would want to do for a living. They were much more looking towards things like lawyer and doctor and very typical, what they considered successful career paths. Um, and so they weren't obviously supportive at all when they found out that this is the path I wanted to pursue. But I think they always felt, as did I at one point, that there was only a short shelf life for how long I could actually be playing poker for a living for. So I think they never ever considered the possibility that it would end up being something I would do long term. And, uh, and originally, you know, of course, there was a lot of, um, you know, discontent from them towards what I was doing. But I think they gradually saw that I was doing well for myself. I wasn't going back to them with my tail between my legs, asking for financial assistance. I think once that happened, you know, for several years, they realized that they weren't in a place where they can necessarily stop me from continuing to pursue poker. But I wouldn't say that they were ever ecstatic about me doing it. And, and you've been able to persist in, in a game where not, not everyone does, right? Um, so I'm wondering, how, how did you train to become better and what advice would you give to someone who's just learning the game? Yeah, I mean, I think that people hear all of the time that obviously now because poker is a much more solved game that studying the, the game theory behind it is extremely important. But I think the other side that isn't talked about as much is bankroll management and having a lot of discipline. And I think that the combination of those two things is what makes someone a successful poker player in the long run. Sure, you could be a highly skilled poker player, but if you don't have the discipline that it takes 
to put in the hours, um, not only studying, but playing, you know, because you're your own boss, right? And I think sometimes people treat it as, okay, well, if I wake up today and I feel like playing, then I'm gonna go play. But if I don't, then I won't. But they don't realize that because poker is the, a long game and you have to be able to put in the number of hours to gradually lower that luck factor and then, you know, tilt it in your favor with the skill edge. I think people don't realize that if you're not playing a, a, a substantial amount of hours, you're not really going to be able to reduce your variance in the game. And then you won't really be able to make a living doing so. And the bankroll management side of it is, I think, a part of what makes a good poker player is you have to be willing to take risks. But I think sometimes poker players take too much risk. And especially when it comes to their bankroll and playing above their means and, and, and in a sense, you know, becoming, treating it as though they're gambling instead of the skill game that it is. And so I've seen a lot of highly talented poker players come through and go broke because they don't know how to exercise good bankroll management. And it's one of those things where you need money to make money. And so if you, end up busting yourself out of the game and your ability to play, then you're not really going to be able to go back and sustain that loss. Right. It, it does sound like it takes tremendous discipline and, and bankroll management. Um, and I think a lot of people might also want to know, like, when you're at the table, poker has a mathematical component, but it also has a psychological component. So when you're sitting at the table, um, what are you devoting most of your energy to? Is it to the math or is it to reading your opponents, trying to put them on hands? I would say that in a live game, I, I feel like I am still going to first and foremost defer to the game theory side of things. But anytime a decision is close and you know there's not a clear answer one way or the other of if I should be calling or if I should be folding, I'm going to definitely use my edge in the psychological side or in what people call poker tells or live tells. Um, I definitely rely on that st still. I think that there's so many poker players that they might excel in that one part, but not excel necessarily in understanding the fundamentals of the game. But that doesn't mean that they can't win in the game. Uh, for me, I like a balance when I'm playing live, but I think if I'm talking about online poker, then I think I'm, I would encourage others. And what I do myself is to strictly stick with the game theory side of things. And in terms of the game theory side, it, it seems like there might've been a time where people didn't really know like what the optimal play was, but you know, in the re recent years, we've seen a lot of advances. There are now, you know, AI poker bots that can, can beat the best human players in the world. So I'm wondering like, how has that caused the, the game to evolve? Yeah, I mean, the game has evolved so much in such a short period of time. You know, poker players that used to play, you know, 40, 50 years ago, not only didn't have solvers and didn't have these AI tools that you're speaking of, but they also didn't have the ability to play online, which allows people now to play a lot of hands in a very short amount of time. So you can essentially now get into poker and gain the same amount of experience in terms of hands played that it took somebody 30 years to get back in the day. And so that also helps speed up your ability to take in information and learn. Um, I think the games become very, very challenging because of that. But at the end of the day, there's still players that don't think that studying is the way that they want to approach the game because maybe it takes the fun out of the game for them. So even though there are all of these tools at people's disposal, I think people would be surprised to know how few players are actually utilizing all of those resources. And there's still a huge camp of poker players that, especially when playing live, don't want to have to take this very methodical and studied approach. And they still want to go by the old methods that they used to. And again, you know, it's, it's, it might be a conversation of maybe old school approach versus new school approach, but, um, 
I think if we're talking about the the skill edge of a professional poker player, then I think the gap is very, very high between someone who's learning very seriously now versus somebody who started 30 years ago. Um, but for the average recreational player, I would still say that that level has remained the same for the last 10 years. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it, it's, it's such a complex game that I think even if you know the optimal strategy, like actually getting there and, and understanding it is, is another thing that takes a lot of effort. Um, I think there are also some stereotypes that, that may kind of date back to, you know, when, when poker was played in saloon halls and, and the Wild West. And um, I'm wondering, like, can you describe, like, what misconceptions exist about poker and or poker players in general? Yeah, I think there's there's several misconceptions. Obviously, in today's society, there is still a stigma around anything that's played in a casino environment, right? I think there's always this nuance of, okay, poker is more gambling and it's not so much skill. So I think the idea of something maybe shady going on behind the scenes or you know, maybe people getting cheated or not necessarily always being on the up and up and it being played in these you know, back alley kind of scenarios. I mean, I would say that that's largely gone in poker now. I'm not saying that those things might not exist um, you know, in very rare situations, but as a whole, that's just not the environment that us poker players professionally, especially are playing in. Um, the tournaments are extremely well run. The integrity of the game is, is of the utmost important to the tournament operators and to the places that hold these tournaments. Um, and I think there's also, you know, this misconception that poker is, from day to day, this exciting endeavor where you can potentially win millions of dollars. But I don't think people realize that if you're talking about the average professional that's putting food on the table and trying to feed their family and trying to pay their bills, that lifestyle is just not as glamorous as I think it can be portrayed sometimes if somebody's watching the World Series of Poker and sees, you know, someone living the dream of playing for $8 million when really poker players are eking out an hourly of, you know, $12, $15 an hour because they want to play for a living, but they don't have the other resources to be able to travel around the world and play these live tournaments. Um, so I think that there's also just this side of poker that I think people don't understand is there are plenty of people out there that are just treating it like a real job. And it's not just about flying from location to location and winning life-changing money. Absolutely. Um, and one reality that, that does seem to exist right now, at least, is that there's a far greater percentage of, of male entrants than female ones. Um, what do you think prevents more women from playing poker at the higher levels? And, and do you think this is changing? I think that it starts a little bit bigger, I mean, a lot bigger than poker, which is just that I don't think society has really ever encouraged women to take part in games uh, that involve high risk situations um, or, you know, certain characteristics and certain traits that I think actually make somebody excel in the game of poker, such as being highly aggressive. Those things are not things that I think women are taught from a young age to embrace those qualities in them. But, you know, you have to have that in order to become a successful poker player. So I felt like in some ways I was lucky because I was a bit of an outlier and I had those characteristics and I, from a very young age, was happy to lean into those characteristics and those have now translated into the game of poker. Um, but for most women, I don't think they feel comfortable doing that. Um, and so trickling down into, you know, the microcosm of, of poker, especially, I think there's not m many women playing the game because I do feel like the environment can be very intimidating for women. I think that in a game where um, there is a, a, a lot of ego and a lot of bravado at times, I think that it, the, the tension feels a little bit too high for a woman to walk into a card room and see from the outset that she is a minority, that there are not a lot of women in that environment, but then to also sit down and play this highly competitive and adversarial game with people who are 
actively trying to make them feel uncomfortable at the poker table at the same time. So I think you'll see women come and try to sit down and play, but they will get up from that experience and have had a very negative one and they won't come back. So I think retaining women, especially in, in the game is hard. I think the interest is there, but getting them through the doors is difficult. And then for that small percentage that come through those doors, a large percentage of that does not come back. Um, and so that, I think that just leads to, you know, fewer and fewer women that are playing competitively. Mm -hmm. So, so one possible solution to get more women involved, uh, I know there are some, like ladies only events, for example, the World Series of Poker has a ladies only event. Um, and, and on the one hand, like, do you think this is a good way to get more women involved um, for the reasons you were talking about? Like you, there's no longer that intimidation factor or worrying about like how a man at the table is going to behave. Uh, or on the other hand, does it suggest that like women and men can't compete on an even even footing when clearly you and, and many others have been able to do so. Yeah, I definitely find ladies event, events, you know, a double edged sword. I think that on the one hand, I think it's important to always have some type of stepping stone, whether it's for women or for amateur players to be able to feel comfortable playing in an open environment. But on the other hand, yeah, it does suggest that there is some reason why women and men can't compete together and at the same level. Um, for me personally, I, I don't really play ladies events at this point in my career, but I would never knock a woman who wants to start out in a ladies event and then gradually move into playing the open events. And I feel like that's why online poker is such a great tool for women, especially because it gets them comfortable with the game. It's one of those things where once you're very comfortable with the game and once you feel confident in your abilities, where poker is concerned, then you can maybe deal with all of the other external factors like the environment. But if you go in, you know, cold into a, a card room and you don't have a lot of experience with the game and you also have no idea what the environment could potentially bring, then you, it's, it's very hard to find your footing there. So again, I see ladies events as a stepping stone. I don't necessarily think that it belongs in the highest levels of the game, of course, but I think as an entry level type of competition, I think it's perfectly fine um, to, to get them, let them get their feet wet a little bit before entering in a tournament where potentially they could feel very uncomfortable. Right. And, and I imagine that the presence of, of you and, and other top female players has been like really important as well in like showing like there are these role models who are already doing it. Right. Um, and what you mentioned that the game is getting um, tougher and tougher. Right. Um, and, and one of the thoughts I had is like, if, if I'm a recreational player and I'm just starting out, um, you know, back a decade ago, it might have been like, you know, I could sort of get my feet wet and I wouldn't be playing well, but the people around me aren't playing that well either, right? So it wouldn't be so, I wouldn't lose so quickly, right? Um, do you think that poker can continue to uh, grow in popularity and, and attract more players when the, the professionals are getting better and better due to the tools that they have? Yeah, I think that there's still room for poker to grow in, in popularity. And I think there's still room for it to be enjoyed even with the fact that there are professional poker players that are playing you know, at much higher levels and are that much better now than your average opponent would have been back in the days. But um, I think a lot of that has to do in a live setting though, because in a live setting, again, we're not robots, we're human. So even if you are playing against somebody who understands game theory, as you had mentioned before, it's one thing to understand it. It's another thing to implement that. And it's another thing on the spot to be able to very seamlessly use all of those tools um, in, in game. And so I think as far as, you know, playing online goes, I think that the competition is, is extremely tough there. And I, I think it would be hard for somebody to come into the game now and expect to be a winning player, especially in the higher stakes. But I do think that 
playing live evens out the playing field, but but there are also poker sites now that are banning, you know, um, any type of real time assistance programs, any type of, you know, third party programs while you're on their software, which again is, is them trying to make uh, the recreational players be on a footing where they can actually beat these pros that are in the games. Um, but, but yeah, I think there is still room. I think again, it's, it's about the operators being on the same page as a lot of the recreational players, which is, you know, which in essence is the lifeblood of, of the community. You know, it's only a very small population of all poker players that are playing professionally. And at the end of the day, you don't want it to be such a predatory ecosystem where it's it's all about you know busting all of the recreational players. The beauty of the game and the reason why the game is so popular in the first place is that any person on any given day has the opportunity to win and to win beating the best poker player in the game. And you have to maintain that sense in order for that for the game to, to remain popular. And so, um, yeah, I do think it's much harder to be starting out now than to start, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But I, I don't necessarily think that poker is dead in the sense of, you know, there's not gonna, going to be any fun from it or any money to be made from it, even if you aren't the best poker player in the world. That, that's encouraging. And, and I know that one way that recreational players, you know, do get involved is sort of showing up uh, in, in Las Vegas in the summer for the World Series. Um, I know the live version had to be canceled in, in 2020. Um, how has the pandemic affected the, the poker environment? And are you optimistic that we'll be able to re return for a World Series in, in 2021? Yeah, I think that poker was in a very fortunate position because there was already always an online poker economy that was going, whether it was, you know, outside and international or in various states that have now legalized within the US online poker. So there was always the option to play online and it wasn't like our industry had to do a complete 180 pivot from just live to online. It's obviously grown the popularity of poker online. And that I think is good because again, I think online is a great way to introduce players to the game. People who are less familiar because they can play from the comfort of their own home and they have the their surroundings, you know, where they feel like they can start approaching the game in the most optimal way before moving on to to a live setting which again can be a lot more intimidating um so i don't think that it's the pandemic because it has affected poker very negatively at all um i think it actually has brought a lot of positives i think that poker in some ways is more popular now um, than ever, you know, it's been a great way for people to socialize with their friends, with having home games within, you know, their friend circles. And again, you know, when people are just stuck indoors and they're online, poker is a really easy right at your fingertips way to, you know, find a little bit of an escape and have some entertainment value. Um, and in terms of how it's going to affect the WSOP moving forward, I think that the WSOP brand itself will tell you that they're very optimistic about their plans to have a live WSOP in 2021. I don't think that it's going to be during the usual time frame, which is the end of May to mid-July. I think they feel like if they move it back a little bit later in the year, then there will be a chance to have a full series, you know, a full schedule of 60, 70 events like they normally do and have the setting and the environment be safe for players. Absolutely. And as you think about your own poker career, um, I, I listed off your, your many accomplishments at, at, at the beginning. Are there any big goals that you still, still want to accomplish in poker? I mean, I think when I first started, like so many people, maybe winning a WSOP bracelet was at the top of that list. But, but the reality sets in after, you know, 15 years of doing this for a living that you can't look to one tournament, one title and say, I want to win that and 
expect that that's going to happen because at the end of the day, because of the variance, especially in tournaments, you know, I don't think hardly any players in their lifetime will ever be able to play enough live tournaments to have a big enough sample size to say, okay, I deserve, or I should based on my abilities win this tournament. Um, and so even though I would love to have a bracelet just because it was always a goal of mine in the beginning, I can't really say that that's a goal of mine now. I think my goal moving forward in the game is honestly just to represent the game of poker in a, as positive of a light as possible. Um, because again, like you mentioned, there, there are some misconceptions still about this game. There is stigma that still surrounds this game. And I would like it if, you know, a 15, 20 year old woman 10 years from now, when they tell their parents that they want to be, you know, a professional poker player when they grow up, that there wouldn't be this negativity surrounding that decision. And so that's kind of the impact that I want to have in the game. So at this point, it's not necessarily a monetary goal. It's not, you know, some, some type of resume builder. It really is just about leaving a footprint in, on the game that will benefit people who want to actually take this game seriously in the years to come and just uh, being a good ambassador. Right. And, and my sense from listening to your commentary is that you really have, have played a role in, in sort of helping advance public understanding in, in what poker is. Um, for listeners who do want to root you on, who want to follow your, you know, continued endeavors in, in poker and elsewhere, um, is there somewhere that they can follow you? Yeah. So, you know, pre-pandemic, I, I, I will post, you know, trip updates from my tournaments, you know, with how I'm doing and sometimes photos and things. So hopefully we'll resume to that um, over the next, you know, six months or so, but they can follow me on Twitter, uh, backslash Maria Ho or on Instagram, Maria underscore Ho, and also my website, mariaho.com. Great. We will, we will add links to those. And Maria Ho, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.